Persona 3 is one of my favorite games of all time. It's actually the first game in the larger Megami Tensei franchise that I've played. It's such a unique game where the protagonist is a completely apathetic, desensitized piece of shit, while also being a well-meaning person that saves everyone. It's a game where the story is completely batshit insane, but at the same time, nothing happens. It's a game where your goal is to climb a tower and kill shadows, but at the same time your party members refuse to actually hit them and instead spam moves like Mary Karen over and over and over. There are very few games I can say that I really love, so believe me that it's not faint praise when I say that Persona 3 is a game that easily makes my top 5. Now is it my favorite game of all time? I don't know. Probably. It's a game with a great premise and idea, wonderful themes and morals, a phenomenal gameplay loop, an absolutely boppin' soundtrack, pointless transphobia that makes you want to stop playing, it truly has it all. Now, the only version of this game that I have played is Persona 3 Fest. That said, I have not played Persona 3 Portable, but I plan to when it is re-released on PC and modern consoles come next month. I'm just throwing it out there so you know where I'm coming from, as shall we say, a critic of the game. My review will not be bogged down by the idea of the protagonist being able to date an elementary school kid, because that is not possible in the version of the game that I have played. That horrifying realization will come back around in January. Persona 3 is a game segmented into three major parts. The dungeon crawling, the life sim, and the script and narrative events. The protagonist, Makoto Yuki. And yes, that's his name, you can't tell me otherwise. The protagonist, Makoto Yuki, is a high school student, therefore most of your week is spent going to school and being given the chance to further certain skills to round out your character. You're also given the opportunity to build relationships with the people around you. Once night comes though, you can initiate the dungeon crawling in the form of Tartars. The dungeon crawling is about what you'd expect. Run around these randomized floors, fight shadows, pick up loot, then continue on to the next floor. Where the game shines is in the core combat of the game. The game is called Persona 3, and a lot of the fun in the game is collecting and using these various personas to maximize your shadow killing proficiency. In battle, you can just swap out your persona on a whim to best tackle the situation. Are you up against an enemy that's weak to fire and another that's weak to ice? Use Orpheus to deal fire damage and switch to a different persona to strike the one that's weak to ice. This is possible due to the press turn one more system, a system where knocking a shadow off balance grants the attacker an extra turn. It's important to note that Persona 4 and Persona 5 made a change where attacks that hit all enemies still will grant you a one more even if they don't knock all the enemies off balance. However, that is not the case in Persona 3. Instead, if all enemies aren't knocked off balance by a skill that targets all, then whoever goes next gets their turn. I find this to be frustrating in certain situations, but I actually like that it offers a risk versus reward that the other games just simply do not have in this regard. The general combat system as a whole is quite fun and it offers a lot of risk versus reward, but it also, as we'll discuss, has a lot of problems regarding RNG. Now I can't really give enough praise to the general combat, something about it is just so fun, but it's also very straightforward, so just by watching the clips in the video I'm sure you'll be able to pick up on what it's like, but there are a few things I need to talk about that I feel are very serious detriments to how this game is. What bigger shit system to start with than the teammate AI? You could be working to set up this perfect battle plan, only for them to just not follow through. At first, I thought I genuinely liked the thought of entrusting to my team to make the right decisions and resorting to the tactic systems. But no, it's just awful. Obviously in other Persona games you're given full control over your party members in combat, but here you're forced to rely on a flawed tactic system that limits what sorts of abilities and actions the AI will use. There comes a certain point where the AI just has moves that are similar to ones they already have, but they're just worse than ones that they have gotten since, and they're equipped with both, and you can't really influence them to use one or the other because they're very similar. Yukari's Persona Isis will know multiple healing skills, and it's just a fucking crapshoot to see which one she picks to best tackle the situation. And obviously, the one she picks most of the time is the one that worst benefits the team. It's honestly kind of laughable how there's just no workaround for this, and even worse is that the skill trees don't make an effort to limit this from happening. Another aspect that I will not give any praise to is the way that the party members will just get tired based on how long you've spent in Tartarus. This is a roadblock most prominent in the earliest part of the game, since I believe the feature scales with level of the party members, but holy shit is it really annoying. You have the potential to grow even stronger. I'm getting kinda tired. 
This is not good. It's like the devs thought you'd run through Tartars too quickly, so instead of just limiting you to how much you can explore based on your progression in the story, which they already do, they decided to just fuck you over by making the party infinitely worse for wanting to play the game. You would think that you could keep going until your very limited SP runs out, making it much more difficult for you to defeat enemies since you can't use your magic skills with your personas, but no, you're just fucked because the game decided, haha, you're tired and you need to quit, or else. Imagine if you were playing Pokemon and the game automatically put an irremovable status ailment on your Pokemon after just a few battles because you had the audacity to use them. Kinda weird, isn't it? Well anyways, with those major gripes out of the way, let's talk about Tartarus. Remember Tartarus? Yeah, let's talk about it now. This is the area where the actual gameplay takes place. The dungeon crawling, where you fight the enemies, find the loot, level up your party and personas. The flow and pacing of the exploration has never felt off to me, yet it's a common criticism I see people raise online. I feel like the floors of interest, i.e. the floors with the boss shadows and the tops of the different areas, are all spaced out pretty evenly and they aren't too difficult or annoying to reach. A point of criticism I see is that Tartarus is, quote, boring. For me, the idea of seemingly endless labyrinth of mixing layouts that's filled with enemies around every corner is just neat to me. It helps that the background music in Tartarus is just dark and ominous, which really helps build the atmosphere. Now, to be fair, compared to the dungeons in Persona 4 and the palaces in Persona 5, Tartarus is quite bland. Where the dungeons in Persona 4 are jam-packed full of style and symbolism, Tartarus is just very bland visual that doesn't really have any variety in the different blocks. Now do I think that's necessarily a bad thing? No, I really don't. I totally understand where some people are coming from I guess, but I personally just really don't care too much about it in this case. The scenery of Tartarus isn't the focus, the mystery is, and the story of Tartarus serves one purpose, to bring about the end of the world. Now if all 250 plus floors look like feeble, then I'd have a bit of a problem with there being no variety at all, but at least some effort was made not to only spice up the scenery, but to also give a clear visual sign that you're getting closer to the top. That sense of progression really sells Tartarus for me personally, because again, it's not really the point. Whereas in Persona 4, you really needed that symbolism to really sell the point of the dungeons. One more thing I want to mention about Tartarus is the experience curve and the frustration associated with it. I personally feel as though the level grinding at the end of the labyrinth is a massive pain. Once your equipped persona is level 75, some enemies will start to run away from you and the game treats you as being overleveled. So what is one supposed to do in a situation like this exactly? Well, the answer to this particular riddle is a little place called Manad. Manad is an optional area that is earned by defeating the Reaper and reaching the very top of Tartarus. If you're able to do this, then you're clearly ready for a bit more of a challenge. So it's actually really neat that something like this is offered to the player. However, Monad is not quite the answer I was hoping for. Monad is a much larger step up in difficulty than I would have first imagined. Shadows of Monad are at least level 88 and higher. That's a 13 level gap between your equipped persona and the enemy. Now keep in mind there's a ton more to combat than just your level, which Monad really does emphasize. For example, the area purposefully mixes up different types of enemies with varying weaknesses to urge the player to be more mindful about what actions are to be taken. What I do love about the combat in this game is the strategy and plans you can formulate. Should you mess up though? Oh boy. Relying on the AI has become something more frequent than you'd like, and as I've explained, that becomes a problem in and of itself. Monad is a short 10 floor area that I really do love the idea of, but I found it to be a lot more impressive than I'd like to admit, and a lot of that is due to just the different RNG elements that kind of just collect and fall on top of each other. It is kind of fun to just go through on this last stretch to grind out those last few levels to get to the max, and I really do feel an obligation to do every playthrough just to fuse for Messiah, but it's just, uh, it can be a difficult and frustrating time sometimes. <laughs> You know what's actually really neat though? Fusion skills. Fusion skills are entirely unique and exclusive to Persona 3 in this capacity. If you have two specific personas, you're capable of performing fusion skills in battle. These heavily vary depending on which skill it is. Cadenza is the first skill of this variety that you'll most likely become familiar with as it's available extremely early in the game. It will restore 50% of each party member's HP while also raising their accuracy and evasion stat. Or, there are skills like Armageddon, which can insta-kill any enemy. Fusion skills are really cool and just add a lot of new possibilities that really shake up the gameplay loop. 
while you can get dependent on using the same ones over and over again, or just opt out of using them entirely, I always tend to hold on to Orpheus and Apsaurus just so I can perform Cadenza in the early parts of the game. The Personas might not be the best, but it's a skill that raises a stat to help me dodge incoming attacks while also being an excellent heal for the early game, which makes the skill worthwhile. There are also moves like Valhalla, which grants the user invincibility for one turn, but after that turn, your HP and SP deplete to one point each, making you completely exposed and vulnerable to a potential game-ending attack. Things like this are just fun to experiment with. Risk versus reward is a very important concept in video games. It's a hard balance to get right where you want to offer something new and useful to the player, but you also need a reasonable cost behind it to keep it from being exploited or overpowered. Look at something like Cadenza. Like I said, it heals the party, raises a stat, and it takes a large chunk of your SP to cast. And the cost scales by percentage rather than a hard number. Sure, you can cast it, but no matter what level you are, it'll limit what you're able to do for the future battles. Fusion skills like Frolic will completely restore the party's HP, but it has a chance to inflict charm to your teammates, making them aid the enemy. Fusion skills are really cool in this regard, and I think they really add to the challenge that comes with Persona 3, in a good way, unlike the AI. Your best moves are locked behind a heavy risk, which brings certain level of challenge to overcome. Which brings us to our next point. I think Persona 3 ranks as one of the more difficult games that I've played in a long time, maybe ever. Now that really isn't saying much, I'm very much into the traditional western RPG, I love games like Fallout New Vegas, Knights of the Old Republic 2, Baldur's Gate, and I don't really think that anyone would say any of these games are particularly difficult. I mean the Kraya fight at the end of KOTOR 2 might be a bit challenging, but the game as a whole is quite easy. Persona 3 though, is actually quite difficult in its entirety. This can be a problem because like I said, the main issue with Persona 3's combat that brings the difficulty up is the AI, the RNG, so many factors just kind of culminate and it just makes for sometimes an agonizing experience. You might just have the wrong strategy, you might just be underleveled, you might have just had a bit of bad luck, all of that is fine. This becomes a problem when you miss your attack all attack, your AI controlled teammates pick useless moves, your current skills can potentially put you in a dangerous spot that can't always be alleviated by the other factors in play. It's hard to properly describe. There are times where you'll lose a fight and you just know it isn't your fault. You know that it wasn't just a spout of bad luck. It's in this manner that the game becomes challenging. It's not overly difficult because it's actually difficult. It's challenging because the game fucks with you. Now with all that said, I still stand by my initial points. I find Tartarus to be very fun to traverse. It's a really cool design and environment. The atmosphere is top notch. The core dungeon crawling is insanely fun and the combat loop and the strategy that goes into it is exciting. Best in the series in my opinion and it's really fun to experiment with. Tartarus isn't the only part of Persona 3 though. There's also the Velvet Room and all that it has to offer. This neat little place is where you can fuse new personas, it plays a role in the story, it houses these little side quests, and it can indirectly benefit your social links. It's the cornerstone of the entire game and one of the most iconic parts in the entire Persona series. After defeating Shadows and Tartarus, you have a chance of triggering a Shuffle Time event. This will take various 2D cards and mix them around on screen, and you have to pick which one you want. These cards can be something like bonus EXP, a weapon, or even a persona. If you choose the persona, it's added to your stock. Once you have at least two personas, you can go to the Velvet Room and fuse them together for a brand new one. If you're one of those gotta catch em all types, then this is how you'll achieve such a goal. You take your existing personas, try out combinations to get different results, and keep going until you have a plethora of new and unique personas to use. Each one focuses on different stats and skills to add variation beyond just how they look in-game. And since this is Persona 3, you can keep trying out new ones to see which ones are capable of using fusion skills with one another. The ultimate complementary resource to this Persona Fusion aspect is the Compendium, a way to register and purchase back old Personas. Say you have fused Orpheus and Thanatos for Messiah, but you really want Thanatos back because he just looks so adorable. You can go into the Compendium to pay a fee just to add him back to your team. This makes building the perfect team enjoyable to do, and it allows you to try out new fusions pain-free, while also allowing you to bring back the Personas that you find useful. The Compendium has been a staple of the entire Shin Megami Tensei franchise, and I'd hate it if Atlas just decided to remove it. Oh yeah. And then there's Elizabeth, the Velvet Room Attendant. 
She will offer you different quests with their own time limits and rewards. These quests vary from either using fusion skills to fusing a persona with a specific skill. She might request that you explore the furthest that Tardis has to offer in your current in-game time frame, or she just have you bring her a specific item. It's nice to have quests not only as a way to direct the player into exploring new options, such as creating new unique personas using the fusion skills, you know, things that I have been saying are very important and very fun to work with, while also providing an incentive for these players to try out these features to get them to fall into the Persona rabbit hole and just see how deep these possibilities can go. Really, the main part that sticks out to me with Persona 3's gameplay is just how simple, yet expansive it is. You have so many options in terms of Persona Fusion, the weapon fusion system, the cards allowing you to raise a Persona stats, allowing the player to wield any weapon with different strengths and weaknesses, everything about Persona 3's dungeon crawling is just so open for the player to dive in and have fun, honestly makes each playthrough looks a little different for me each time I play. Technically, there aren't as many options open to the player as opposed to something like Persona 4 and Persona 5, but in a vacuum, every aspect of this game complements one another while also being expansive in their own ways. That, mixed with the killer aesthetic and working as a Tartarus, makes the dungeon crawling part of Persona 3 unrivaled in my honest opinion, which is odd considering that everyone seems to hate Persona 3's dungeon crawling. Persona nowadays is best known for its characters and its social link system, so let's talk about them. Social links are mostly optional little story bits in the game where the player can interact with specific characters on certain days to learn more about them. These characters you meet with have their own individual story arcs and you're there to watch it unfold. Makoto is there to learn about the characters, offer his own perspective, and in some cases get directly involved in whatever is happening. When you complete all 10 stages of a social link, you are given the ability to fuse for the ultimate persona of that arcana. Truly a really nice reward and incentive to engage with all these digital people to begin with. One thing that I love, which I believe is exclusive to Persona 3 Fest, is that when you max out every social link in the game, you're able to fuse for Orpheus Telos, a recolor and stronger form of your starting Persona. I just think this is such a cool reward for setting out and doing all that the game has to offer. I'll add that there's a huge time management factor, meaning that completing every link in your first playthrough is impossible if you don't know what you're doing. The game has clever ways of introducing the player to new links that are available, but you still have to figure out the prerequisites, the schedule for them, where they're at, whether or not it's smarter to do one link over another on any particular day. Now, one could raise the argument that the devs make this aspect extremely difficult. Like sure, it's possible to max out all the links, and sure, they direct you in which way to go, but there's a general lack of direction of what works best for maxing out each link. Like, each character with a social link has certain dialogue choices from the player that they'll like over another. So there's this hidden system where the link needs so many points to advance to the next stage, and if it isn't met, you have to waste a day with this character to get the points that you've missed. Answering in ways that the character prefers gets you more points. By having a persona of that same arcana, you're given more points for these answers you choose. It's a really cool system, but I personally found it needlessly confusing and directionless at first. Yeah, the game points you which way to go, but getting a grasp of the system you're so encouraged to use is on another level. And yes, I really do think that it drags down the entire system just a little bit. Now while I think Persona 3's social links overall are rather weak in regards to Persona 4 and 5, all the social links work great to give insight into the lives of various different people that you meet along the way on your journey. You get to learn more about Yukari and her relationship with her mom and how she's afraid of being alone, how she's happy to finally have someone she can really trust. You're going to meet people like Kazushi, who's pushing himself to his absolute physical limit for the sake of another that he holds dear. You're going to meet people like Akinari, a teenager with a degenerative disease that knows he doesn't have much time left. He always starts writing books, but he never finishes them. With you on his side, he thinks of an ending for his current book, a happy one at that. And with that, his spirit passes on, and you're given his notebook as proof that he accomplished his dream. The social link system allows you to engage with these various characters or witness their own stories and their own arcs unfold. It's a really unique system that just adds so much that I completely understand why this feature is what Persona is really known for. It complements the story and theme perfectly in Persona 3, and it adds a bit of incentive to the core gameplay. All of it is just so well done that despite some of the weaker links in Persona 3 and kind of how it's bogged down by the functionality of it, it's still super enjoyable to go through and learn about these people. And finally, there's the main story. Persona 3 is a story about fighting shadows that represent the Arcana, or at least, that's what the literal story is about. Persona 3 is actually about death, mortality, and the meaning of life. As I said at the beginning, Makoto is a piece of shit at the start of the game. 
At the end of it, he realizes the only way to save everyone, to save his friends, is to sacrifice himself. The game where you run around in circles on a beach trying to pick up women also asks the question of whether or not you'd willingly forget your friends and your experiences with them just to die peacefully, or if you'd rather remember the time you all spent together but suffer an agonizing death fighting against something that cannot be stopped. In the vein of Persona 4's Izanami and how everyone wishes for the fog, how the people wish to avert their eyes from the truth, Persona 3's Nyx and Ryoji basically exist for the masses' wish for death. People aren't strong enough to deal with life's pains and hardships, so they just long for the end. This is all beautifully told to the player by focusing on the conflicts in the group and the overall narrative between your main party C's and the antagonist group being Strega. While all of the fights against Strega are insanely easy and rather disappointing in that regard, the thematic importance is unrivaled, and this is what hooked me with Persona 3 initially. I didn't know anything about the game, I just heard what the message and the point of the game was. It's clear and just so powerful through moments like with Ken and Shinjiro on the October 4th operation, Akihiko mourning the loss of his friend Shinjiro, and Shidori using her powers to sacrifice herself so that Junpei could live. All of it is so great and easily the best parts of the game. I guess you're right. I was too obsessed with power. Ever since I lost Miki, that's all I've cared about. I thought that if I was strong enough, I could protect anyone. But I was wrong. And now you're gone too. I'm such an idiot. The writing at Persona 3 is just so good when it comes to the main story, and it is so satisfying to play through all of it and hit all those story beats every time. All of this culminates in an exciting climax against Strega and Ryoji's true form as the next avatar. This leads to my favorite video game ending of all time. Igus is explaining to Makoto that she's found her answer to what the meaning of life is, and her smile is the last thing that Makoto sees before the light consumes him, and he passes on. After fighting alongside you and facing the world's end, I finally began to understand what it means to live. Thinking for yourself, not running away. Accepting the inevitable. All things eventually come to an end. Every living thing will one day disappear. Only by accepting this can one discover what they truly want. What the meaning of their life will be. Makoto started apathetic. He lost his parents a decade ago, had death literally sealed inside him, and he was pushed around from various foster homes with no real goal in sight. Upon discovering his power, meeting his friends, various people across the city, he was able to witness something great. Life playing out. Through all of the shit the people went through, it was still beautiful. Without these hardships, there would be no meaning. Without our memories, or our mortality for that matter, then what really is the point of life? It is for these reasons that I think Persona 3 is such a beautiful game in its narrative and its themes. The moment man devoured the fruit of knowledge, he sealed his fate. Entrusting his future to the cards, man clings to a dim hope. Yet the arcana is the means by which all is revealed. Beyond the beaten path lies the absolute end. It matters not who you are. Death awaits you. And with that, I really don't have much else to say about Persona 3. I've touched on all the major elements that I feel I needed to discuss, and ultimately, I just wanted to share my love and honest opinion for this game that I can proudly say is one of my favorites. While every major aspect has flaws and hindrances keeping it from being a perfect package, I think every main facet of the game is really well thought out, well executed, and ultimately just fun to play. Sure, there's tons of RNG, and sure, there's a scene where you kick a trans woman off the beach, but Persona 3 transcends those blemishes. For me, it's a game that touches on the important message that no other game has done nearly as well. It provides an enjoyable dungeon crawling aesthetic and gameplay loop that I honestly feel is the peak in the franchise, and the game is just so fun and I'd recommend it to anybody that's interested.
Hey people, this took way longer than it should have. Uh, I spent a really long time trying to perfect the original script, then I realized it'd probably be better if I just provided a quicker, more palatable review than a long, drawn out gush fest. Like the first script was roughly 40 to 50 minutes in length. I just want to take this moment to say that I really enjoyed making this video, and any feedback would be greatly appreciated. I have this habit of editing videos together, but never releasing them for one reason or another, so I just hope this one turns out well and marks a new beginning for the channel since I've taken a lot of time off. No more Battlefront 2 mod previews, now it'll just be short video essays and whatever else I'm passionate about. When Persona 3 Portable re-releases, I might make a quick video giving my opinion on that version. I know the FEMC route has notable differences, and I might just make a more direct video regarding the answer too, maybe? Who knows? Nothing is set in stone, and I'm not just gonna do more Mega 10 or Persona stuff either. I have other things planned, and I'm really excited to finally get some projects worked up again. It's been a long time, but I'm back in my groove. Anyways, thank you so much for watching if you made it all the way to this point. I hope you have a great day. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, bye-bye.